Therefore, my beloved, my longed-for brethren, my joy, my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Euodia, and I implore Syntyche, be of the same mind in the Lord. I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God will surpass all under, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do. And the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you send aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. There is so many things here, so many sermons embedded in nearly every clause. But as we have followed through in this book and as, as, as we have noticed the thematic elements that Paul has addressed. There is conflict coming against this congregation. There is conflict within this congregation. So Epaphroditus carries this letter home. Paul wants to encourage these people. He loves these people. These people love Paul. And it just seems that they're perhaps starting to falter. They need some encouragement. They, they need to know how 
they can let their light shine against the world that is attacking them. They need to understand how important it is to let their light shine within the walls of the church with one another. So Paul reminds them there in chapter 1, hey, for me to live is Christ. Don't forget that that's the whole thing here. That's the entire ball game. It's all about Jesus. It has to remain all about Jesus. In fact, I'm so in love with the master. I don't know if it's better to stay here and help you through this mess or to go and be with him in glory. I am hard pressed to make such a decision. Paul understands the decision wasn't so much his as it was the Roman Empire who would eventually take his head. But for the time being, he says, it's important for me to be here to help you. For me to live is Christ, and you need to remember that that's your calling. Your conduct in Philippi, your, your conduct in the face of those who would attack you, your, your conduct from within the congregation itself, your conduct needs to be worthy your conduct needs to be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Don't strive against each other, but strive together for the gospel. And he reminds them of the humiliation of Christ there in chapter 2. He reminds them that Christ lived a life of shame and scandal. From birth to death. Born in shame and scandal. He lived a life of shame and scandal. In case you have forgotten, Jesus, meek and mild, was called a drunkard. He was called a wicked partier. He was the kind of person that hung around the wrong kind of people. This is not a man you should trust. This is a man you should doubt. This is a deceiver. This is a guy who just hangs out at parties and gets drunk with the tax collectors and with the harlots. As Christians, we can forget the accusations that were hurled against Christ because we think of the cross, we think of the empty tomb, we think of our Savior, we think of the Son of God, we think of God the Son. We think of the Holy One, as the Scripture calls Him. But that's not how they looked at Him when He walked the earth. He lived a life of shame and scandal. And then He died, humiliated on a cross nakedly, in pain and agony. But why did he do it? It was his father's will. He was obedient to the will of his father, even to death, even the death of the cross. As Christians, we need to be prepared, as Jesus said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Follow me on the way to death. Follow me on the path of humiliation. As Christians in the West, we forget what Christianity is. It's good that we read these missionary letters about Christians who live not in a land of many churches, but in a land of paganism, in a land of Hinduism, in a land that is antagonistic far more than, you know, we complain about our own citizens and government who come against Christ in the church here. We don't even understand what persecution is. Like Jesus, I feel like I want to vomit when I think of the Christian testimony in this country, I remember many years ago listening to the news and there was a Christian church who had started a home Bible study. And there were now like, I forget how many, but it was like over a hundred people coming to this home Bible study. And so the streets were crowded with hundreds of cars. Because you know in California, one person per car, right? <laughs> so, and so they were being persecuted because the neighbors couldn't get into their houses and complained. We're being persecuted because we're Christians. 
because we're blocking the whole street with all of our cars. Persecution! They don't like Jesus over here in this neighborhood. Maybe they just want to get in their driveway. If that's what we think persecution is, uh, we just need to remember our missionaries who are really persecuted. The, do you know that these persecuted evangelists that go up to the north in India where the persecution is the most severe, they're not being persecuted because they're blocking somebody's driveway. They're not being persecuted because they're causing an inconvenience to somebody. They're being persecuted because of the gospel. And I love the words of Peter. I forget if it's his first or second letter. Uh, if you're going to be persecuted, make sure it's for righteousness. Don't be persecuted for something that maybe you deserve to go to jail for. Right? You broke some law. Right? Let's not do that. Okay? If we're going to be persecuted, let's be persecuted for righteousness sake. For the gospel. Jesus didn't go around blocking people's driveways and then say, oh, they're putting me on a cross because I'm so inconvenient. Christians in the West. Are we Christians at all? And so, let's get off of that hobby horse. Paul reminds them of the humiliation of Christ and the humiliation that Christ calls us to. Pick up your cross. Take it up. Follow me. If you're following Jesus and you're just like, hey, this is easy stuff. Oh, you forgot the cross. Okay? If, if your life isn't bent over in, with burdens of humiliation, if your pride hasn't suffered in following Christ, are you following him? Well, what are Christian churches in America known for? In, in perhaps Europe, I imagine. In the West. We're not so much known by our love for one another that the whole world might know that we're his disciples. What are we known for? Church splits. Hypocrisy. Judgmental attitudes. I mean, you just ask anybody on the street, right? You get that little Jay Valeno microphone. Hey, what do you think about the church? Well, I hear there are a bunch of hypocrites who split their churches on a constant basis every fortnight. It's church split here, church split here. People don't get along here. That's what we're known for. My, my, my. We don't like humility, humbleness, carrying a cross, which in case we have forgotten, was an instrument of death, was an instrument of humiliation. We carry them around our necks, even if we're not Christians. I mean, you can just see the most perverted people out there, but they got a nice cross chain because it's just a cool symbol. Now, when Jesus said, carry the cross, he said, okay, it's time for you to die. It's time for you to lose your life and find it in me and to imitate me and to follow after me. And so when the people of the world come against you, you have a humble and meek attitude like me. When the world came against me, nail this hand, nail this hand, nail these feet. I'm not going anywhere because I've been called to this cross. But no, what do we do? Oh, what are you doing? Get away from me. I have my rights, you know. And we always have to be right. But no, Jesus didn't call us to that. He called us to obedience. And he provided for us an example of obedience. And Christians and the church at large need to get back to this type of Christ following obedience. And so I, I keep emphasizing that in every sermon because it is the core of the letter. And it's what holds the letter together. As we move into these latter portions of the letter, as Paul has mentioned about the women who are causing turmoil, and he has called his team to help these people women to be reconciled, that there might be peace in the church so that they can be stronger together as they face the adversary from without. Now he begins to say, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. And he speaks about they didn't always have an opportunity to send him 
care packages and gifts of aid to help him. But he understands they did care and he uses this as an opportunity to once again step into his own autobiography. To, to show what it is to follow Christ in humiliation. And he says, I've learned a thing or two. Remember earlier in verse 9? Don't forget what you've learned from me. And now he talks about what he has learned. What he wants them to learn from him. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Adversary from without. I'm content in the Lord. Difficulties from within. Paul had plenty of those when you read his letters. Content in the Lord to do his will. How does God want me to walk through this trial? A trial against the world, a trial against other Christians. How can I navigate this in Christ-like fashion? Well, first of all, I have learned that whether things are going right whether things are going wrong, I am simply going to be content in Christ. My joy is centered on Him. It is not centered on circumstances. It is not centered on people. It is centered on Him. My circumstances may change. The Lord Jesus will not. These people that I have as friends, people around me in the church, my relationships with them may change for better or worse, but Jesus never changes. He is the same today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the changeless one. So my joy is based in him. That's why when he talks about these women who are not getting along, after he talks about the church needs to come together to put this, this contention to rest, he immediately follows it up with rejoice. It doesn't matter how hard that conflict is. It doesn't matter how draining it is. Rejoice in the Lord, the changeless one. He knows it's going to take work. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take some humility. But he mentions, trust the Lord. Take all of your cares, all your anxious thoughts. Take them to him. Pray about it and rejoice in him. So I've learned what is it, whatever's going on in my life, whatever's going on with the people in my life, my joy is centered on Christ. My life is centered on Christ. For me to live is Christ. And from him, I draw life. From him, I draw joy. And it is for him and because of him that I march through whatever comes against me. I know, he says, how to be abased. I know how to be humiliated. You can read the book of Acts and you can see, you can read Paul's letters, you can begin to understand things did not often go easily for Paul. He often met conflict. Conflict from the world and conflict even from Christians. Read the Corinthian letter. It's a difficult letter if you put yourself in the shoes of the apostle. Why is he always having to defend himself as he writes to these Christian churches? Why are they arguing? Well, I don't listen to Paul. I listen to Peter. Well, I don't listen to Peter or Paul. I listen to Apollos. Well, me, I'm, a, I'm of Christ. Right? I don't listen to any of these men. Right? And you're like, wow, not much has changed in 2,000 years. The arguments and craziness of the Corinthian church are with us here today. But Paul says, hey, I've been on that road of humiliation. And I was content to be there. Because I'm on the path of obedience. I'm following after Christ. I'm carrying my cross. I've counted the cost. And this is my way forward. It's Christ. And in him I am content. And in him I find joy even when I'm abased. I know how to abound. Hey, there have been those moments where life was all right. Things were going well. I've been there. I've, I've seen the negative. I've seen the positive. I've been through the times of famine and the times of prosperity. But my commitment to Christ, my purpose for living, which is Christ, 
has nothing to do with whether I have something to eat or whether I don't. Whether ministry is going fine or ministry is a real drag. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be ah, full. I've learned also to be, oh, I wish I had something to eat, hungry. But it's centered on the Lord. Does, if I'm going through a trial, if I am hunger, if I feel the pains, whether physical or even emotional, whatever's coming against me, Christ is still my motivation. And do you notice the difference here? See, when we're hungry, when we're humiliated, when we're abased, so often the Western Christian's attitude, their answer, their response is cynicism and bitterness and maybe I'm just going to leave the church. This really isn't for me. God's not the genie I thought he was. I don't think Jesus is listening to my prayers for prosperity and abundance. But not Paul. For me to live is Christ. If I'm living hungry, it's Christ. If I'm living full, it's Christ. Nothing causes me to waver because I'm standing on the rock that is Christ. And then he brings it home. I can do all these things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, you, we would think it doesn't take much strength to abound, to be full, to enjoy life. But it does take the strength of Christ not to be lifted up in pride in those times. It does take the strength of Christ to then move from those times into the more difficult times. Everything was going so great. What happened? I thought I had job security. Now I'm looking for a job. I thought this relationship was going to be everything, and now she or he has left me. I, look at these kids that I held and loved, and now they're rebellious. Oh, what happened? It takes Christ to keep us from pride, and it takes Christ to keep us from cynicism and bitterness and despair when things go the other way. See, I can do these things I can handle the temptations to pride. I can handle the despair, the sorrow, when I'm humiliated, when all is lost. I, I can handle these things, not because of me, but because Christ is strengthening me. Christ is helping me. I'm centered on him. I'm trusting in him. I'm never going to forsake him. I'm just going to follow after him. I'm going to once again place that cross on my shoulders and I'm going to keep going. I'm going to trudge along. So, Paul gives us a powerful testimony here to reconsider how we face the joys, the pleasures, the difficulties, the trials of life. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and it doesn't matter what that living entails. Easy living difficult living. Whatever it is, what does he say in verse 10? I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Greatly. And earlier, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. But Paul, your life hasn't always been easy. Looks like the Lord's not always taking care of you. Oh, no, no, never think that. No, I'm, I'm trusting in him. I'm not blaming him. I'm preaching his gospel. I'm testifying of his love and grace. But as Christians, our life is going to be like Jesus. If, if we are going to follow Jesus, he said, the world hated me. Don't be surprised when it hates you. The world was tough on me. Don't be surprised when it's tough on you. And then in this interesting body called the church, Sometimes there's times of growth and prosperity and, and joy in the Lord. And other times there's difficulties and strife and sorrow and, and all the things that come with that. But we must trust the Lord. We must keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. And we must learn this lesson. If we haven't learned it, let's begin to learn it. 
Let's begin to teach it to our kids that we might learn it better. Whatever state we are in, whatever's going on in our life, let us be content because we can do that in the Lord. Jesus will strengthen us. We cast our cares upon him knowing he cares for us. And we will discover that we can go through the times of prosperity without becoming prideful and the times of turmoil and difficulty without becoming cynical. We just stay our eyes upon the Lord.